Hello and welcome to You So You. My name's Zoe and this is my channel all about the crafty bits and pieces I get up to. I knit, I sew, I spin on a spindle, I dabble in weaving from time to time and anything else that takes my crafty fancy. But today we're talking about my plans for 2023 so grab a brew, put your feet up and let's get started. to any returning viewers and to any new viewers a very warm welcome to you as I mentioned at the opening to this video this week we're looking at my plans for 2023 but before we do that let's take a look at how I did on 2022 now for the past few years I've been doing a make nine plan and attempting to complete it and uh, not quite managing it 2022 was no exception I'm just going to look over here because that's where I've got my notes of, of what I had planned and what I actually achieved but let me bring them around the front. Okay, so I planned to, to knit a Christmas sweater last year. Did that? That's this one. But, uh, I also planned to knit a Fair Isle sweater. I was planning on the Terra Nova and that one I did as well. So I got that done in, uh, well, started in February, finished in April. Um, I'll insert pictures of things um, as they become relevant. On the screen, I'm really pleased with that sweater. I wear it a lot. It's uh, it was one with like five steaks, so it's all over Fair Isle, but it also has lace panels down the sleeves and down the sides, and you knit the, the sleeves from cuff to cuff, um, circular fashion, and then you steak it for the cuffs. Uh, you steak at the neck. You add a lace panel in. There's all sorts going on, and then you steep the sides as well to, to add a, a lace panel in. So it's a complicated design, um, but actually once you get going, it's fine, because Fair Isle, you're only working with two colours at a time. Um, just make sure you have a stiff drink on hand for all the steaking. Uh, so the third pattern, well, third project that I had planned was a long line cardigan design. It was a knitting project. I have the design in mind i have the the color work that i want to do on it plotted out on uh, the computer and um, i know what yarn i want to use for it I haven't cast it on um, i also want to do a scrappy sweater i did think about doing a design i ended up doing the flax like cardigan with all the steaking um for that so i'm counting that as done um even though it wasn't my the original intention that that's a scrappy sweater so that counts um, sewing wise, dressmaking wise, I wanted to make a funnel neck roll, roll neck top. I made the South Bank sweater, um, which I wear a lot, so that was a good one. I probably might will make some more of that type of top uh, moving forwards because that's a very functional part of my wardrobe. I did also plan on making a long sleeve tee, which I didn't get to. Um, I, I have a, a bodysuit planned, um, but more on that in a minute. Um, I had it planned this year, didn't get to it, so uh, yeah. Um, I planned to make some leggings, but nope, didn't do that. Planned to make some jeans, but no, no, didn't do that. And I wanted to make a plain kind of A-line neutral coloured skirt that I could wear with my pattern fabrics. Whilst I didn't make a skirt, I did make the bastion clots, which filled that gap in the wardrobe, or at least they will do when I move the buttons, because they're a little bit loose at the moment. Um, but they've got that A-line shape, so they do fill that gap in the wardrobe. And that was my thinking last year with Make Nine, was to fill gaps. So I managed to complete one, two, three, four, five out of nine. Which for me is not terrible, particularly when you consider that I have another one that is very close to, to getting done. I need to cut the fabric, but the pattern's been modified uh, for the Rowan bodysuit. Um, and I do have the pattern design in my head for the cardigan I just didn't get it cast on so five done two needle adjacent and two not even close <laughs> so for me that's not bad for make nine I, I normally I'm lucky if I get three done um but of course I'm, I'm going to be doing a make, make nine again uh this year but let me explain my process my thought process when it came to planning this year's crafting so first of all I wanted to think about what do I want to develop? What do I want to get better at over the course of 2023? So there's three things I wanted to think about. I want to improve my fit um, for, for dressmaking and for knitting and crochet. 
So for that, I'm going to be looking at developing my modification skills, particularly with dressmaking. Uh, there's quite a lot of modifications that I could be making that I'm not making. Uh, there's probably some modifications that haven't even occurred to me. So I need to learn a little bit more about how to adjust for my particular body type and put that in practice. Um, I also want to be thinking more about the patterns that I'm choosing to make sure that they are the style, the silhouette, the seam lines, the style lines that are going to work for my body type uh, rather than just going, oh, that's pretty, that looks really nice on this tall, slim, evenly balanced hourglass figure that I just don't have and never will because I'm short-waisted. Um, so I'm never going to have an hourglass figure. It's just not going to happen. It's not perfectly proportioned hourglass figure because my narrowest point is a bit higher up proportionately speaking. Um, so yes, yeah, so if thinking about the patterns I'm choosing with a view to being able to modify them for a better fit. And as a bit of a stretch aim on that, that point, be looking at drafting my own patterns to fit my body shape. Um, so they will be drafted for me. They will not be, it is not my intention at this point in time to share them with the wider world. Um, there, there's too many body types out there at the moment for my level of knowledge. Plus I've got absolutely no idea how to make a PDF pattern. Not a clue, that, that element of technology escapes me. Uh, the next thing I wanted to think about, and I'm very much on the Fs my uh, focus is this year, is finish. So I want to improve my interior finishing skills on garments. That's particularly a dressmaking thing. And so I like French seams. I don't often use them. I do have a serger, which is great. Um, I like bound seams. Again, don't often use them. I quite often go, it's together. It goes on. It'll do. Uh, but I'd like to just up my game a little bit on how I finish the interiors there. Um, I'd also like to improve my pressing techniques. I was taught to iron as a child. Um, I was taught to iron by my father, who was in the military. So I can press a shirt really well um, for wear, but that's not the same as pressing seams for sewing to get the right finish that you're after. Um, so that is something that I want to develop. Um, so it may well be that I need to get a clap out at some point to improve that, particularly with heavier weight fabrics and particularly with some of the projects that I have in mind for this year, that would probably be a good choice. I may well need to get a tailor's ham at some point to help with that and those sorts of things and learn how to use them properly to get the best results possible. Um, the other thing that I want to think about uh, is actually selecting my fabrics with the finish that I'm going to achieve in mind. Um, so because I'm part of the Minerva Brand Ambassadors programme, I don't often buy fabric um, because I'm not sewing all the time. I, I knit and I weave and I crochet and all that sort of stuff. So I'm not sewing like, every day. Uh, so I don't buy a lot of fabric. I have some fabric in stash that I bought for particular projects that I never got round to or that just didn't work in the end for, for what I had in mind. Um, so I do have a small fabric stash. But generally, I'm getting my fabrics from Minerva, and that's obviously a limited selection for what they've got available for that programme. So you do tend to go, oh, that's nice. I could make this with it. Rather than going, I want to make this, which of those fabrics is going to be a good fit? And if they haven't got the fabric there, just, just not getting it. So I need to get a little bit better about that. Um, and actually, when I've got a project I definitely want to make, I will go out and look and buy fabric if, if I need to. Um, but again, I'm still not always thinking, is that going to give me the high end finish that I would like to be able to achieve? And I think that's going to make a big difference. If I'm picking fabrics that, that don't press well for a project that needs crisp lines, it's not going to get the finish that I'm after. Um, so that that's my second area of focus for 2023. And my third and final area of focus for 2023 is function. I would like to have by the end of the year, a functional wardrobe that I actually wear every item of um, or wear the majority of with frequency depending on the, the season. So it's about curating what I've got, it's about being versatile, maybe verging on a capsule wardrobe style really. Um, so there's going to be a lot of clearing out and getting rid of stuff that I just don't wear. We've got a lot of charity shops in town so that's not a problem. Um, some stuff I'll harvest the fabric from and 
use for other things. But I don't want to have a large wardrobe full of things that I like, that I'm proud of because I made them, but I'm not wearing. That, that seems a little pointless to me. So, so yeah, so functionality. Will it fit in the wardrobe? Um, will I use it? Um, that doesn't mean to say that I won't be doing projects just for the sake of doing the projects. There are some things that I'd like to do this year that are more for developing my skills in the other two focus areas than they are for being functional in my wardrobe. The thinking being that if I use the projects to develop the skills, the stuff that's in my wardrobe, that's the, the functional side of things, I'm going to be more inclined to wear because the fit is going to be better, the finish is going to be better because I've done these other projects that are there just as skill builders. Um, so that's my, my main aims for the year. Um, I do also want to reduce my whip list. I actually wrote out my whip list um, the other day. Um, so on my whip list, I have, I stood it, put it into two sections. Uh, it's taking up two pages in my notebook. I have 14 active whips. So whips that I've worked on in, at some point in the past year. And I have 19 dormant whips. So projects that I have not worked on in the last year. Um, and it's a mixture of different crafts, some crochet, some knitting, some cross stitch, some dressmaking, some weaving, some spinning. I've got a diamond painting project that I haven't touched in years that I really want to get done and actually up on the wall. So one of my aims is to actually reduce that, that list down. I've, I've broken it down into action steps for me, but I don't need to go into all of that for you. So I've got, right, I want these ones to finish by this date and these ones to finish by this date. But essentially, I'm looking at by halfway through the year, having completed 16 of those whips, um, as in actually finished them, and having made noticeable progress on the remaining 17. Now, so I've got 33 total whips, 14 active, 19 dormant. So the first few months of the year, I'm going to be focusing on getting some of those whips finished, flogging the ones that aren't going to get worked on, restarting ones that need restarting, and just making progress and making sure that they've all had a little bit of work done on so that they do eventually get out of the craft room where they are being stored and taking up space, which will enable me to then reorganise my craft room properly how I'd like it to be and therefore get more done in it. Um, I also want to do some more designing and um, fit that in somewhere. My plans, oh, weird like coming through, it's just morning, early morning. Um, so I do want to start doing some designs. I do have a few patterns. I have three patterns out there. I have a cowl, I have a hat and I have a pair of socks. Uh, the hat is free. The cowl and the socks are paid for. They're on Ravelry, they're on Lovecraft, so feel free to check those out if you are so inclined. Um, but I'd like to do a bit more of that. I haven't done any in a while. Um, at least I haven't got any designs finished in a while. Um, but I would like to do, to do some more of that. I'd like to do some accessories, I'd like to do some socks, I'd like to do some garments. Um, so that's something that I'd like to at least progress a bit further in 2023. Um, so obviously having uh, the craft room better organised was going to make it a lot easier to do that. It's also going to make it a lot easier for, for dressmaking, for fit and all that kind of thing. And I also have some spinning goals, um, but I'll get to that a little bit later. I'm going to go over my make nine first and then we'll get to spinning. Um, so yeah, so a bit of a whip focus at the beginning part of the year getting that list a bit more manageable. <laughs> um, and yeah, I've, I've got a wish list of projects as well, which is another two pages, but we're not going to go through all of that. So when I went through actually planning out my Make Nine, I thought about those three, fun three uh, focus areas, fit, finish, function. And I split the year up into quarters so that I could work out what I wanted to focus on in each quarter. So whether I wanted to to focus on fit first or finish first or whatever. So the first quarter, I'm gonna be doing a bit of research on fit. I'm gonna be planning some designs. I'm gonna be focusing on my whips and I'm gonna be evaluating my wardrobe. Second quarter, so April through to June, I'm gonna be looking at some hand stitching because that if I can improve my hand stitching, then I can improve my finish. We're looking at finishing techniques. I'm gonna be applying my, the newly refreshed uh, knowledge on fit and planning a functional wardrobe 
and still carrying on developing design ideas. Third quarter, July to September, hand stitching, embellishments, that kind of thing. So again, think about finish, think about functionality, maybe even picking up a few new crafts if I have time, because there are some more that I want to try. And then the final quarter of the year, putting it all together um, and yeah, just building on everything that I've done throughout the year. So I have sort of planned out what I want to be thinking about in each of those three month blocks. So then we got to my make nine plans. So we started with the ones that I didn't get to last, like this year. Um, I keep saying this year, I'm filming in December 22. I know this is going live in January 23. I'm going to be like this for a couple of weeks. Timey wimey stuff. Okay, so 2022's make nine. I didn't get to make my long line cardi that I have a design in mind for. I didn't get to make jeans, which I've been meaning to make for a few years now. Um, and I didn't make, get to make leggings, um, which I think will be a useful part of my wardrobe. So the, the cardigan is it's a design that I'll be coming up with. That if I, if it works, turns out well, I can look at grading and looking at putting it out in the wide world. And it's going to be part of a functional wardrobe. And by long line, I'm thinking mid thigh to knee. So the jeans, it's a dressmaking project. That's going to be skill building in the areas of finish and fit. And the leggings, again, dressmaking, it's a skill builder in terms of fit and finish. And again, it's functional wardrobe. So everything that is on my make nine, I've been thinking about in those ways. Does it meet up with any of my focuses for the year? How's it going to work out? So now we're going into um, if things that are more sort of skills focused rather than functionality. I want to make a hand stitched wearable garment of some kind. Probably a top, possibly a shift. Um, so it's a dressmaking project and it's a skill builder for fit and for finish. Hand stitching is very useful for finishing techniques. So, so yeah, so that's more a skill building project. Depending on what I end up making, it might be part of a functional wardrobe, but it depends on what I pick for that project. The next choice on my make night is very definitely skill building and um, it's less a functional part of my wardrobe at the moment um possibly for special occasions if i get it right i'd like to make a corset yeah it's a bit of an adventurous one and um, so yeah it's dressmaking slash tailoring um historically speaking tailors used to make corsets um that so they are were made custom fit to each individual person. It wasn't until mass production in the Victorian age that, that, ch that changed and they weren't then made to specific individuals, body measurements. Um, so fit was a very crucial part of them, historically speaking. So dressmaking slash tailoring, and uh, there's a lot of hand se sewing that is gonna be required there for the binding or what have you, because I am not running a sewing machine over bones. To, uh, uh, yeah, skill building for fit and finish. Um, and also, I have this vague idea of possibly making my own wedding dress if we ever actually get a date set. So, so if that ever happens, or if I ever have need to make an evening gown, actually having the corset skills would be quite useful. Um, and the third part of this more sort of skill based project, um, it is also a functional wardrobe piece. Wardrobe piece. Let's say lingerie drawer. I'd like to make a bra or two. Uh, so again, it's dressmaking. It's important for, for when you're making bras, the fit and the finish are very important. So it's going to build skills. Whether I'll end up flashing my, uh, my underwear on the interwebs remains to be seen. I may chicken out. Um, but that is something that I'm intending on making in 2023. Then we move on to um, more functional focused items but that are still skill building in some way. So long sleeve base layer or layers. Um, obviously I've already made the funnel neck with the South Bank sweater. So possibly more of those. I've also got the Rowan bodysuit ready to be cut out and sewn up. That will also be a base layer. So th that one is gonna get done quite quickly. It's dressmaking, it's functional wardrobe, particularly in the colder months. Um, I'm just gonna try and keep out of the light as best as I can. Um, and yeah, in terms of fit and finish, for a base layer, you're going to want something a bit tighter fitted, a bit closer fitting than you would for a normal long sleeve tee. So fit is going to be important. 
and finishing jersey nicely. It's like, I'm, I'm still learning to use my serger, so it's, we're getting there. They're not bad, they're not terrible, but there's a bit of finessing that I can probably do there. So item eight on my list. It's very definitely a skill builder, but it is also a functional part of, of my uh, wardrobe. It's dressmaking slash tailoring. It's uh, going to be focusing on fit and finish as well as being functional. Um, this is kind of inspired by Lady Rebecca fashions. Now I've been main, meaning, meaning, I've been meaning to make a more tailored structured coat for the winter for quite a while. Um, I made the truffle coat last year, which is a good coat. It's warm, it's cosy, it's more waterproof than I expected soft shell to be. Um, I did mess up the uh, grading when I got to the hood, so the hood is completely unfunctional, but that's fine. Um, but it was not the tailored style of coat that I would like to do from a skills development point of view. And um, then I was watching Lady Rebecca Fashions over Christmas and she made a quilted Brunswick. Now Lady Rebecca Fashions, she does um, historical garments um, largely. And a Brunswick is a historical overcoat effectively. And um, it was, the one that she made was kind of lower hip, mid thigh kind of length. And it's fitted into the body and it's got a hood. Um, and the sleeves are in two parts, you have an upper and a lower and it had a frill around the elbow. Um, so yeah, it's a historical garment. Apparently there's not really any patterns or there's no patterns out there for it. Um, but that's okay because for my coat, I'm going for a more 21st century silhouette. So the skirt section would be slimmer. Um, not sure about the frill around the elbows. I'd probably go for a longer line. I'd probably be going for below the knee to, to mid calf, that kind of length. So it's a, a long winter coat. And I'd probably be looking to do it in some sort of wool. Um, hence, I may possibly need a clapper to get the, the seams pressed properly. Um, so it's gonna be quite an intense project. Lots of tailoring, lots of finishing techniques, but the aspects of the, the Brunswick that really sort of grabbed my attention were the shaping was done through darts under the arm rather than on the front. So I thought that was really interesting. So it was like a side seam on the one that she was looking at. Um, and then there was a dart in the front, long darts, so sort of about an inch, inch and a half under the arm and went down to the, upper, the high hip and then opened up into the skirt. And then it's the same on the other side of the, the side seam from, from what it appeared to be in the, the pictures. And um, so it gave it nice, cinched in shape at the top and then this flare out for the skirt so and I'm obviously not going to need the flare out to be as large as the I think it was 17th century something like that and uh, so their skirts obviously have to be a bit bigger on their overcoats um, but I like that use of darts down the side that was a really interesting feature and the hood was gathered at the back so look we're talking proper fairy tale style hood big hood but um unlike the one on my truffle coat, the one that will actually stay up um, and not fall off my head at the slightest breeze. So, so yes, it was gathered at the back using cartridge pleats. So there was a little little hole, like a finger sized hole in the middle of the back of the hood, but that's not gonna be too much of an issue. So yeah, so the hood and the darts in particular were aspects that I was thinking of lifting from a Brunswick and putting into a modern winter coat. Um, I may have to draft it myself, possibly. I might find a coat that I can modify, um, a, a winter coat pattern that I can add some width into the, the pieces to get the darts in um, and then stick a historical hood on it. Who knows? Well, let's see, I have to do a bit of hunting for that one. Okay, a little bit of a shuffle around, a bit out of the dodgy sunlight. Okay, so. Final make time project for 23 is I want to make a Christmas cardigan. Obviously I have my Christmas sweater now, that's great. Um, but cardigans have a particular uh, practicality to them. So Christmas slash winter cardigan. I have the Scum Ring pattern by Skandir, which is a colourwork cardigan that is designed with a gradient of yarns in mind. So um, that's what I'm thinking, unless I find another one that I, I like even more. Um, but yeah, so it's some sort of wintery, Christmassy 
cardigan for next year. And I'm planning on starting it before December this time around because, oh, that was stressful knitting. Okay, so today is St. Distaff's Day and I couldn't possibly let it go past without talking about my spinning plans. Obviously, come the summer, there will be tour de fleece. That's a, a given. Um, first part of the year, though, I'm looking at spinning through some of my stash of fibre that I have upstairs. I'm also looking to develop my skills with my jalagon. Now, I normally use my jalagon like a drop spindle, um, which is fine, but it wobbles a bit as it spins. I was watching Gillian Eve's Vlogmas, who does a lot of spinning videos, um, and she was using her jalagon in her hand. So she was leaving it in her hand. She wasn't fully suspending it and, and using a distaff. Not that I have a distaff. Um, but she was using a distaff to hold the fibre and drawing it off the distaff with the fibre hand and then keeping the spindle in the other hand. Largely because she'd seen a portrait of somebody actually using a jalagon and that's how they seemed to be using it. So I'm going to give that a try with my jalagon and see if that works a bit better than using it like a drop spindle, which is obviously how I learned to spin, so I'm very comfortable using things like a drop spindle. Um, I'm also going to do a bit of research, a bit of academic um, knowledge seeking. Academic. I haven't done any academic research for a long time, but it's, it's a skill. I'm sure it's still there somewhere. Um, into the history of spindles of different types, um, to, uh, learning a bit more about their origins and how they were used in history and where they came from, and all that kind of stuff. Um, to, to develop my knowledge and then hopefully that will inform my technique. And I also have my other spinning goal relates to this spindle, which I showed you in, in my last video, uh, the one I got for Christmas, which is a supported spindle. And I will insert a bit of footage as it's uh, St. Distaff's Day of me spinning this spindle or, or of it spinning anyway. I am very much a learner with supported spindles. So uh, that's my other goal for 2023. Get used to using this one. I do like it. I do enjoy spinning on it. Um, I can sit the bowl between my knees. It's got a little dip inside, in the sides so it fits between my knees. Or I can have it on a table. And I can uh, do a longer draw with a supported spindle than I could with a drop spindle because it's not going to fall to the ground. So, so that's good. Um, it also... I've had a play on my stepmom's spinning wheel uh, when, when it was, she hadn't had it all that long. Um, and those of you who spin on a spinning wheel will know what I mean by this. When you're spinning on a supported spindle and you're winding on, you can get the spindle to take up the yarn like you would on a spinning wheel. So you're spinning off the point with the supported spindle and you have to get the angle right. So you want to be, be drafting so that you've got like a five to 45 degree angle with the yarn that you're, you're making. If you bring it to 90 degrees, whilst the spindle is spinning, it will take up the yarn. So you can use a spindle to wind on. So that I really like. I am very much still at the uh, park and draft stage with this spindle, but I can see how people can get into a flow and um, have quite a continuous motion, if not, entirely continuous but uh, a fairly continuous motion from drafting to to getting the twist in to getting onto to the spindle i can see that being quite rhythmic and um, i have found that it it responds better when you've got less fiber in your hand than i would have for say my drop spindles and um, i found that it takes a lot less twist than the drop spindles or it needs less twist than the drop spindles. it can take more but it needs less than the drop spindles and it seems to like it more when you fluffed up the fibre that you're spinning with. Um, so it's, it's a more woollen type of spin than I get on my drop spindles. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's interesting. Still lots to learn on this one. But yeah, enjoying it. So that's my plans for 2023. I will obviously keep you updated as the year progresses. Um, let me know in the comments down below anything that you're focusing on for the year. And I will see you in the next video, which will be next weekend. Uh, but until then, happy crafting and bye-bye for now.